at least Gladys Friday anyway. Um, we were doing some assembly okay. language programming, and we're going to be doing some more of that this morning. Um, but before we go on to that, we've got this little mini topic in between, uh, which is a walk around the pins on a classic 8051. So we'll do that. That'll probably take us anywhere between half an hour and the first hour, and then we'll move on to assembly language programming part two. Um, which is the more challenging bit of assembly language programming. Okay, so <clears throat> rather than just go through the slides, um, let's draw a stylized eighty fifty one and. Uh, an 8051 classic, if you want, has four ports and it comes in a 40 pin package. So, a dual in line package, 40 pin. Those four ports um, are labelled port 0, port 2, port 1, and port 3. Each of those ports is 8 bits, so of our, 42 pin, of our 40 pins, well that's 8 pins, another 8, another 8, another 8. We've also got um, ground and VCC, which in the classic uh, 851 is 5 volts. Most of them will run happily down to about 3 volts as well kind of useful, because uh, a lot of logic these days is 3 volts. So that brings us up to, that's uh, 34 pins, 32 plus uh, another 2, power. so that's 34. Um, elsewhere, I'm not drawing this accurately, there are two pins which are set aside for the external crystal. crystal. Although there is an oscillator circuit built into the 8051, it's not a complete oscillator circuit. It's missing a couple of passive components. Uh, now, you can buy versions of it now that do have everything inside, but um, the classic one certainly doesn't. So there's a small circuit you have to design outside that looks something like this. Hey, man. two little capacitors and some kind of resonator like a quartz crystal. Um, the advantage of um, having the resonator crystal outside the device is you can choose the value of it that you want. So to some extent you can control how fast the 8051 goes. Now generally you might say, I just want it to go as fast as possible, and yes you can do that, and there, there will be an upper limit. The upper limit will be uh, determined by the manufacturer and their data sheet. But you can get versions of it that can comfortably up to go up to about uh, 30 megahertz. I know by today's standards that seems remarkably slow, but for an embedded system that's not too bad. However, sometimes we're going to get this microcontroller to talk to other equipment. And then, actually, it isn't always the best thing is to have the fastest crystal speed, because the speed at which it sends messages out to other things um, is based on the speed of this crystal, but it will be divided down by a certain amount using a kind of counter chain, um, a series of flip-flops. And some values divide down by two into nice numbers into what we call the standard board rates and other crystal frequencies don't divide nicely into those frequencies. So you'll often find, and I'll be coming back to this in a couple weeks anyway, um, one crystal that's quite often used is 11.0592 megahertz. It seems an absolutely bizarre speed. 
but actually that particular frequency, when you do divide it down by two a number of times, you end up with all the standard board rates you'd recognize, like 9,600 board, uh, 19,200, and all those kinds of things. So if you want this to connect to like a PC through a serial interface, then that would be a good choice of crystal to use. Anyway, I digress. So that's another two pins there. So we've got um, 32 plus 2 for the power plus 2 for the crystal. So that's 36, I think. Yeah. We've got a, a pin on here somewhere called reset. And the reset on a classic 8051 is active high. So when you switch it on, uh, the reset pin needs to be held high for a certain amount of time and then after a while brought low. Um, a very simple circuit for achieving this. Is something like this. So what we have to start with when we switch the power on, um, effectively there's no charge in this capacitor, so charge can kind of flow through it. So the reset sees almost all the five volts. The charge will start to build up on the capacitor, okay? And when it does, it starts to repel any kind of further flow across it. So transients go across capacitors, but DC doesn't. So when the charge builds up, effectively this becomes like a, an, almost like an infinite resistance, and then the, the pull-down resistor will have much more of an impact. And so effectively this will pull down the reset over time. So you'll end up with something that will look like this. Why, that's kind of cool. That's just okay, that's cool. Let's see. So nice. And the slope of this will be Governed by the exponential thing for the time constant, whatever it is. Typically, um, it has to be above a certain level uh, for about, I think it's something like two milliseconds in a classic 8051. Um, if that's 10 microfarads and that's about um, 8 or 10k, I think it should be fine. So that's that one more pin that we've talked about. Okay. So, so far we've got two pins for the crystal, two pins for the power and ground, one pin for the reset, that's five, plus the other ports, 32, so 32 plus five, 37, got three more to go. Um, I can think of two of them, I'm trying to think what the third one is. I might have to look it up. Two other pins. Oh, I know what they are. Here I am. One down here. One of these pins you've actually met already, which is the EA pin, um, which either stands for external access or external addressing. It is this pin that determines where the microcontroller goes to find the program memory. If this pin is low, even if there is internal program memory, it will be ignored and the microcontroller will look outside of itself to find the program memory, no matter what. If this pin is high, it will look inside for the program memory. And it then depends on the manufacturer what happens. If you say you've got 4K of internal program memory and all your code fetches within that 4K, it will only do things internally. If you try and extend beyond that, it may well look for program memory outside as well. Yeah. Can you change that during the program? Go inside and outside. Oh, yeah. um, I suppose you could. I don't know how safe it would be to do that. Um, I've never known of anyone doing it. Um, like I say, if it's high, you can still use it, usually external program memory as well, but you use the, the start of the memory block is internal, then the rest of it can be external. Um, dynamically switching this, I, I don't know how safe that would be. I'm not saying you couldn't do it, I've never ever come across anyone who's ever done it. Um, 
so you might be the first. Does, um, in order to talk to external program memory, now remember program memory, as far as the 851 is concerned, it can't write to it. The 851 is a Harvard architecture, it's not von Neumann. So as far as it's concerned, it has these two types of memory. Code memory, if you like, program memory, and data memory. And as far as it's concerned, program memory, as if by magic, just appears and it's there. And it can read it, but it can't write to it. So it needs a signal to read it. Read it, and that signal is this one called P7, which I suppose stands for program sense. It's effectively a read signal for code memory. So, for example, if as part of your instruction set, you're telling, oh yeah, I'm fetching the next instruction or um, you're accessing a table that's in the program memory using the move C instruction or something, um, it will be PSEN that will be the read signal that will be used to wake up the external device, for example. And then there is another signal, and this is the one I'm going to talk about a little bit more, called ALE, Address Latch Enable. I think that's probably all the 40. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yes, yeah, right, 8. 5, 8 to 40. So that's all the pins on the 851. Now, I haven't really said much about many of them, how we, how we use them, and I'm going to go into more detail now. In this course, in an exam, you would be expected to know about all the pins on a classic 851. I wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to draw them in the right places, you know, oh, it's pin 23 that's this, and pin 24 is that. I don't expect that level of detail, but some kind of drawing of an 851 showing, if you like, all the different pins correctly labelled, if not necessarily assigned to the right pin number. Okay, so I'm now going to focus on this particular pin. Um, I talk about external memory. You can see in a, a classic 8051, to build a complete computer, as well as the chip itself, there was those other components we needed. We needed a resistor and a capacitor for the reset circuit. And we needed two capacitors and a crystal for the oscillator circuit. So it requires five external components. Five external passive components. And that's all you need for a complete 8051 system. Um, nothing that's particular to the 8051, but something, especially in design and build or anything like that, your projects that you're working on. I'll just mention it in passing. Let's say you've got a power supply feeding some kind of microprocessor, some active device. Um, it's always very good practice to wire close to the device a capacitor. The closer you can put it to the device between the VCC pin and the ground pin, the better. And the reason why we do this is if this is not here, let's say this has got a million transistors inside it, and all of a sudden, all those transistors switch on. So there's a huge current drain. You're basically going to be taking lots of charge off the power supply rail. So lots of charge has been taken from this wire up here. Now that will be replaced by the power supply, but it takes time for the power supply to replace the charge. During that time, the voltage on here will actually drop. So if you looked at um, an oscilloscope on here, without this capacitor, and you were looking at the voltage, it would do, tend to do something like this. And this dip in the voltage could be low enough that it actually causes the device to basically misbehave, not behave properly. Whereas having a capacitor across DCC and ground closeness acts like a little mini battery. It's charged and normally not doing anything. But when you suddenly have a, a lot of switching going on inside here, 
any kind of dip that results, the charge will flow off the capacitor and fill in the dip. Basically, you've got a, a reservoir of charge sitting here ready for you. So if there are any switching transients, that charge can basically make sure that the power doesn't dip too much. Now, usually it's about 1.1 microfarad ceramic. And it's got nothing to do with the 8051 in particular. Any, if you like, microprocessor, microcontroller, any integrated circuit that has more than about two transistors on it, it's usually good practice to decouple it. That's the technical term for this. This is a decoupling capacitor. So anyway, so in terms of the external components, as well as the ones I've already mentioned, for the reset circuit and the oscillator circuit, I would usually expect to see a capacitor between VCC and ground. <coughs> okay, I'm going to rub this out. Okay, so the 8051, as well as the internal data memory and the internal code memory, can access external data memory and external code memory. But let's have a look at the pins on it. Well, how are we going to do this? Well, the way Intel decided to do this was, first of all, it had to decide how much external memory is directly addressable. And Intel decided that it would allow for up to 64K of program memory and 64K of external data memory. So if we need to uniquely identify 60, well, 65, what's it, 5, 3, 6 different locations, which we um, slang, we, we talk about as being 64K, um, how many address lines do we need to uniquely identify those different locations? Well, you can work it out, it works out to 2 to the power of 16. They're all the different combinations of address, I mean 16 address lines to access that many unique locations. If you don't believe me, let's do it with a simple example. If we had eight external locations, you would need two to the power of three address lines. You'd need A0, A1, and A2. All the combinations of ones and zeros you can think of, there are eight combinations of ones and zeros that gives you the ability to access eight distinct locations. So, in the case of the 8051, somewhere on here, we've got to make ourselves 16 address lines. We've got to use some of those pins for 16 address lines. In addition, Intel said, well, okay, each of these external memory locations are going to hold one bit of information, eight bits of information, 16 bits of information. They decided each memory location would hold eight bits of information. It would be byte wide. So we're going to be, if you like, reading or writing bytes of information at a time. So that tells us how much data lines we need, how many data lines from this to the outside world. We need eight because it's eight bits wide. So we have 16 address lines plus eight data lines, which in total gives us 24 pins that we're going to need in order to achieve this. Now we could say, ah, oh, it's not a problem. What we'll do is we'll use those two ports. They can be the address, and maybe this port can be act as the data. But in addition to that, we also need some other signals. Um, now we have PSEN to read from code memory, but we have no control signals for reading from data memory. I've mentioned that. We're going to need a couple of signals for reading and writing to data memory. So we're going to need a read signal, and we're going to need a write signal. And that's another two things. So already, decided, you know, we've decided we're going to connect to something in the outside world, um, in terms of the pins that we have at our disposal, we, we seem to be going to be using quite a lot of them. And it could be that we decide to use port 2 and port 0, for example, the address, port 1 for the data, and then perhaps part of port 3 for some of the control signals. But that would leave us with very few additional lines, if you like, pins, to control devices. You know, in a classic 8051 system, you might have the 8051, you might have the 
you might have some external code memory, and you might have some external data memory, and then there's going to be some kind of I.O. devices, some kind of peripherals that you want to control. Well, if we've used almost all the pins on the HP if you want to talk to these things, there's not a lot left over to control these devices. So Intel decided to do something. And what they decided to do is to use a concept called multiplexing. So this is where this signal comes in. This signal assumes that the external memory is going to be wired up in a very particular way. I'm going to show you now. The purpose of it is to try and make better use of the limited number of pins at Intel's disposal. So what they assume is port zero is going to have multiple roles. It's going to be used for different things. It's going to be used as part of the address bus it's also going to be used as the data bus. It's going to have two jobs. Uh, well, it can't do both things at the same time. So the solution to that problem is we have an external latch. The classic version of it that we use is an LS7473. Well, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be that. There are others as well. This is an 8-bit latch. So port 0 is connected to one side of this 8-bit latch. The other side of it is going to be used as the low part, the low part of the address. Low in the sense of it's the lowest eight bits of the address. Remember, we want 16 address lines. So eight address lines are going to come from this side of the latch. Well, let's make this a bit different. Um, isn't the necessarily the best drawing. Port two is going to provide the other part of the address. So the upper part of the address is going to come from port 2. So this is the high part of the address. So this is um, A15 down to A8. This is going to be A7 down to 0. This funny little signal ALE is effectively used to control the latch. Here's some external memory. And for now, let's not worry about external code memory. Let's just have um, data memory. In fact, let's do both. I'll do the data first, though. Data. This is external data memory, so it's kind of going into here. It's going into here. And going into here. So this is the data. This is part of the address. This is another part of the address. Remember, this is 8 bits wide. This is 8 bits wide. This is 8 bits wide. In order to achieve this, and we haven't quite finished yet, there's a few things we're missing yet. Why don't you just connect two ledges to one port and use uh, two things to control the ledges? Ask Intel. I don't know. Um, you're, you're having more uh, external peripherals, so to speak. So one of the, and in though, at the time this was built, you could get an 8-bit latch, you can get a 16-bit latch, so you'd have to have two devices. Um, so it's probably, they, when they left, kind of look at the cost and so forth, they probably decided that this was a compromise, but the most economical compromise. You could. Yeah, and then you need two control pins. Yes, that's true. Um, and you could double up both ports if you could do that. But they didn't. Okay. Um, so that's that's the problem. Okay. Um, so 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 that's the problem
we would have to get whoever it was, he or she from Intel that designed this and stand them in and say, well, why didn't you do that? You could have done it that way. I don't know why. Um, this is the way they did it. I suspect there was some engineering reason why they chose this way, but I don't know what it is. But it's probably a compromise somewhere along the lines. Okay, to access external data memory, we also need to be able to read and write. We need control signals for it. Well, so far I haven't said where they're going to come from. Now, they actually, in the case of the classic 8051, they're stolen from part of port 3. So a read signal and a write signal are taken as two of the pins on port 3. So, what we now have is 16 address lines, which allows us to access the external data memory uh, of 2 to the power 16 different locations. And each of those locations is one byte wide, so that gives us effectively a 64K external data memory. In order to access this 64K external data memory, we've used eight 16, 18 pins from our ports. Effectively, we've saved ourselves eight pins because instead of having to use three whole ports to do the address and data, we've done that with only two of the three, two ports. But one of those ports is having two jobs to do. So I haven't said how it actually achieves it yet. So let's do that now. The way the system works and we'll see this in more detail when I go through the slides, is effectively, um, when it's fetching from external data memory, first of all, port zero writes out the low part of the address. So let's say that we want to get information from external data memory, uh, one, two, three, four hex. Okay? So we would write out on here, um, the low, this is the low byte, and this is the high byte. So out here, we would write ourselves through the form. And on port two, the upper part of the address, we write out one, two. We then trigger this latch signal to lock into the latch the value three, four. So three, four gets stored in here and is being written out at this point. We then remove, we alter the latch signal so it ignores the input. So as soon as we've locked it into the latch, port zero can now be used for something else. The latch is going to hold on to that value. So in the first phase, we wrote out port zero something stored in the latch using this special signal to lock it into the latch. That then frees up port zero to be used for a different purpose. Port 2 holds on to the upper part of the address the whole time this is going on. Now, you, you know, it could be said that why didn't we multiplex up port 2? Yes, you could have done, but that's not the way Intel have done it. So port 2 has got the upper part of the address. The latch is now holding the lower part of the address. This has got one, two here. This now leaves port 0 to be used for other things. And it can't affect the lower part of the address because the input side of the latch is ignoring any input. What we then do is, either using the read or the write signal, we then tell this external memory, you know, oh, I want to read from you at whichever this location is, or I want to write to that location. So then what happens, the, the data will either flow port zero into there if we're doing a write operation, or if we're doing a read operation, port zero will be sampled by the microcontroller. So if it's a read, this will be enabled, the data will be presented by the memory here, which will basically appear here as well, and port zero will be read by the microcontroller. If we do, um, and that's it, that's the whole process. So in order to access um, external memory, we have 